Ephesians, and I want to read out of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Now you hear a lot about our God and uh, things today and how that, uh, you know, and, and they equate the power of God as being when you're having whatever you have and it causes you to shout or it causes you to cry and emotions and, and all of that and God moving and people getting all stirred up, whatever. And they say that's the power of God. I want you to look at the power of God. First of all, let me just say this. Uh, when the glory of God came down in the wilderness in that tabernacle, uh, the glory of God would come down. Those people couldn't even go in. They couldn't stand it. They couldn't even enter in. Uh, well, nobody's ever really seen the glory of God except Moses. Uh, and uh, as far as that type of glory... And he had to put a veil over his face because his face shone so bright they couldn't look upon him. How do you want that? <laughs> I mean, we think about the power of God. If God manifested himself here in this building right now, it'd burn you to a grip. Well, that's what Hebrews said. Our God is a consuming fire. Uh, no man's ever looked upon him. You can't look upon him. And so I want you to think about the power of God. I want the power of God in my life. Don't you? And so I want us to look. I believe there is the power of God in the believer's life. But I want us to look at it scripturally. I want us to look at what the Bible says. Don't worry about what some preacher says. Don't worry about what I say. Look at what the Bible says about this in the dispensation of grace. Now, there is a time coming in the future. And that time period will be when God will take vengeance on this earth in flame and fire. And he will consume them. And they will, he will destroy them. But today, God is not dealing with this world in wrath. God is not dealing. Listen, if God, I hear people say, God, you can't live in sin and have the blessings of God on you. Have you ever heard that? Uh, God's going to judge America because how sinful it is. And God is judging America. If God judged people based upon their sin, He could not save anybody. He would have to destroy everybody. God is not judging people and countries based upon their sin today, God's offering grace to those people. But there is a day come when God will judge the nations of this world. And there is a day of coming that God is going to speak to this world in His wrath and He will burn them. He will judge them. He will destroy them. He will trample them under His feet. But today, if God judged men, how could a sinner come to God, a holy righteous God, and Him save him? He would destroy him before He could save him. No wonder Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross 
is the only way that God can offer grace to this world. The cross is the only way that God can save sinners today. Why? Because them sins had to be paid for. Them sins had to be judged. Your sins had to be paid for. Your sins had to be judged. And God judged your sins. And he poured his wrath out against your sins on the cross, on his son. And his son died your death, paid for your sins. He died on that cross for you. And God can offer you grace based upon your faith in what his son did. And people think and get to heaven some other way. Well, you've got to be kidding me. There is no other way. There is no other salvation under heaven except by the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you're trust, everybody in this world trusts somebody or something. And if you're trusting in your goodness, you're going to burn. If you're trusting in your church membership, you're going to get the wrath. If you're trusting in... Whatever you're trusting in, if it's not the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on that cross, if it's not trusting that as your salvation, you have no hope right now except to trust that. There is a power. And that was one of them. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. How can God exercise his power in forgiving mankind and in justifying people like we are? He knew how he'd be after we saved us and he saved us anyway. That's grace. How could God do something like that? How could God have respect to somebody like me? How can he be mindful to somebody like me? Knowing my failures, knowing my shortcomings, knowing my sinful things and, and my faults and everything like that. How could God be merciful to somebody like me? He can be merciful to me because of his son. Wipe the slate clean for me. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Religion can't give you that. No power in religion. No power in the mystery of iniquity. But there's power in what Jesus did for you. I want you to look in Ephesians chapter 3. Power. Now, gave you the one, the power of God to save people is the cross. But look in Ephesians chapter 3. Notice what he said in verse uh, 20. Ephesians 3, 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Now boy, that's something, isn't it? Now you got to let that thing just sink in there. He can do, he's able. That's what he said. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that what? Worketh where? In us. If you're a believer today, if you're trusted Christ as your Savior, you have a power that's in you. You might not be aware of that power, but it's there. Look back in verse 16. In verse 16 of chapter 3. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might. There's the same word as power. To be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Where is that power that worketh in us? It's in the inner man. Where does it come from? Through his spirit. He has 
given us his spirit. Now I want to give you some things about this. So number two, the gospel was the power that he could save you, but he gives you his spirit. Look back in chapter one. In chapter one, every believer has the spirit of Christ in them. That's power. You don't need some outside source to guide you. You have the power of Almighty God that's in you. Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom He also trusted. After that He heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. All right, that's the power. Then number two, in whom also after that ye believe that gospel now, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Then the God sealed you with the Holy Spirit. Do you know you're the only ones that has been sealed by the Spirit of God? The twelve was not sealed by the Spirit of God. The believers in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, they were not sealed with the Spirit of God. The Hebrews through Revelation, the people that after we're gone, they will not be sealed by the Spirit of God. You're the only ones that are sealed by the Spirit of God. Look in the chapter 4. In chapter 4, notice in verse 30. In chapter 4, verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The day of redemption will be the redemption of your body. It will be when you, God, He changes your vile body and passes it like unto His glorious body. Folks, you have the power of His Spirit dwelling in your old body right now in that inner man, that man, the inner part of you that he created when he saved you. Look back in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Notice in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And because of that, Talking about power, you're in the spirit and not in the flesh. You live in the flesh, you have an old fleshly body, but you, the you that's in that body, is in the spirit. Now look what he says in Romans. In verse 8, chapter 8, verse 8, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit condition. If so be that the spirit of God, what? Dwell in you. So that's the condition. If you have the spirit of God, Dwelling in you, you're not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. And I'll show you what that is. Look at what he said. He said, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit, capital S, is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal. Them bodies you've got right now. He's going to bring them alive. Look what he said. Bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. He aids us in service. In other words, we become alive in this old body under God. We used to yield our members to the satisfying of the flesh. Now we want to take this body.
body and use it for his glory. Who put that in your heart? The Lord did. The Spirit quickens that old body and you want to live for it. Amen. Power. Who could change somebody like us? He can. But look on down with me. He goes on down in verse uh, verse uh, 14. For as many as well, I mean, I, let me tell you what. Go back and read verse 12. Therefore, because of his spirit that dwell, therefore, brethren, you're not debtors to the flesh. You don't owe the flesh. You don't owe that old man anything. But he said, you're not of the flesh to live after the flesh. What is living after the flesh? It's minding the things of the flesh. It's, it's just concerning everything that will satisfy this old man. The old man. He's number one. The old man. You put him up. No, no, no. He's the fuck. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, you're to reckon himself to be dead. He's not to reign in your life no more. Who does the Lord? The Lord is the king now. The Lord is the CEO of your life. The, you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, in your spirit. That's which are God's. And that's the whole point. Ownership. But he goes on, he said, for as many as, verse 13, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many are as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And he said, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know who your father is. Now I've read all of that, but I want you to come down and notice what he says there. Look back with me. He talks about the spirit. Turn over to 2 Corinthians in chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The spirit of God dwells in us. That's powerful. I don't need no guardian angel. I have the Spirit of God with me. I have the Spirit of Christ. I'm in Christ. Look what he said, verse there, verse 20, chapter 1, or 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God. Uh, of God in him, or yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which established us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us as God, who also uh, who hath also sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The earnest is a down payment. It's like a, here's a, like you put down earnest money on land or something. You pay certain much down, it binds the contract. God gave you the Spirit of Christ when He saved you, and He sealed you under the day of redemption. And the last thing about this, turn over to Second Corinthians. I mean, Second uh, Timothy. And notice this seal. Second, uh, I keep wanting to say Second Corinthians, Second Timothy, chapter two. Power that worketh in us. The gospel, whereby you are saved. The Spirit of God in the inner man, strengthened by might, power by His Spirit. And I want you to see how he does that, but I want you to see this seal. Verse 18, chapter 2, verse 18, who concerning the truth of Aaron saying the resurrection is past already and overthrew the faith of some. They got the shipwrecked. Nevertheless, even though they're not believing what is right, even though they're not believing the truth anymore, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 
That seal is a seal of ownership. And the Lord puts his seal on you. Honor. That's what Lord means. Honor. He bought you. He bought you with a price. And that price was the, his only begotten son. And his son went to that cross and he purchased you. And you are his. give you that power and he sealed you. <coughs> and I want to give you some, the baptism. Notice the kingdom that you're in. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Well, everybody talks about advancing the kingdom. Well, you are, you're in a kingdom. Colossians chapter 1. Notice in <coughs> verse 12. Colossians 1, 12. Given thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, there's where you was, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. You're in it right now. That word translated, the only other person I know besides the body of Christ that was translated in this Bible was Eden. God translated him and took him, and he was not. One of these days, God's going to take you out of this world, but you right now, as a believer, are in the kingdom of his dear son. And it's a spiritual kingdom. And it's a powerful kingdom. Look back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, notice verse 20. Well, I'll tell you what, go back to verse 18, get the context of the thing. Now some are puffed up. They're mad. Blowed up, you know. You know how it is when people get puffed up at you. You've heard that. He's a little puffy now. He, he's puffed up at me. <laughs> yeah. You ever had that? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> All right. Notice what he said. Now some are puffed up as though I would not come. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know, not the speech of them, that's puffed up at me, you know, speech is nothing, and, and uh, speech of them which are puffed up, but the what? Power. You know, it affects people. You, you know? Look what he said in verse 20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in what? Power. Have you ever been grieved when people, and you might, whether you caused it or not, act like they're mad at you? You know what I'm talking about? Somebody gets nipped at somebody and, 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 and you don't understand and, and all of a sudden you, it bothers you. That's the power. That's part of that power. Look back with me to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Folks, what you do in the body of Christ affects other members of the body of Christ. It's power. Amen. You're not in this alone. You might think you are, but you have the whole body of Christ Right there with you. And the way you live, the way you act, the things you say, whatever, there's power in that that affects people. Look what he says in Romans chapter 14. Did I say 14 or 15? Uh, did I give you a verse? 17. 17. Of what he said. For the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but righteousness.
righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Did, does the Spirit of God dwell in you? Amen. You're in the Spirit, not in the flesh. You're translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. You're in a spiritual kingdom. You're in a spiritual realm. And there's joy, peace, righteousness in that realm. That's what you enjoy. That's what we long for. There's power in this. Now I'm going to give you three things in the next ten minutes or so. Now that so can be so long. <laughs> I want you to see number one, God works in you. We already established He gave you His Spirit. Turn to Philippians chapter we established the power now. The power is in the kingdom. The power is in his spirit. The power is in the gospel. I want you to see it works in you. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, you're to live it out. Not work for it, work it out, let it out. Look what he said, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You know what God wants to do in you? He wants to work his pleasure out and his will out of your life. Sometimes we just don't want him to do it. That's power. God works in you through his spirit. Look back with me in uh, where we was at. Turn back a couple pages to Ephesians chapter uh, 3. Where we was at. Notice in verse, I'm going to read that again. Uh, Ephesians 3. Again, look what he said in verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his Lord to be strengthened with might and his power. By his spirit. You know the spirit of God wants to work out your salvation to others. He wants to do his pleasure. What is his will and will? God will have all men to be saved come unto the knowledge of the truth. God's will is men, you, members of your family, members of your community, members of this county, members of this state, members of this world, members of all over the world. God's will is for them to be saved. How are they going to ever get saved? They've got to hear the gospel. How are they going to hear the gospel? Through the members of the body of Christ that are saved. And if they don't hear it through them, they'll never hear it. God help us to get the truth out. God give us a burden that we can get the truth out. Don't you understand, folks? We get people saved that the body of Christ would get the going and the body of Christ would get people and get the gospel out and people would get saved. We might get out of here soon. I'm Back in the 70s and 80s, if you would have come up to me and said, Brother Brian, do you believe we'd be here in 2015? I'd say, no way. But here we are. I often wondered if the body of Christ, when the gospel would be got out, people would have got saved. You say, well, God knows. Yes, he does. He knew how slack we'd be, so we're still here in 2015. Longest dispensation of any dispensation in the Bible. <coughs> 2,000 years of grace, God has been long-suffering with this world since his son went to that cross and died for this world. And God has been long-suffering and he's waited and on the way to get his truth out is through the people that he saves by his grace. And the day we live in a day where the, his people that are saved, they're not wanting. I 
I want you to see is we not only to get people saved, but how many people that are saved that would love to know the truth that you know. How many members of the body of Christ that would be perfected and would be brought into closer relationship with the Word of God and with the Lord Jesus Christ if they knew the doctrines of Paul? How are they going to know it? They got to know it by you. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. Notice what he says in verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's not going to stop working for you. Why would you want to stop working for him? He's going to perform it. He's going to do it. He started something in you. The day that you trusted Christ as your Savior, He began a good work in you, and He's going to keep on working until He gets you home. The second thing is, we not only God works in us, but his word. Look in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. And notice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is a good one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And notice in verse. <coughs> Did I say 2 Thessalonians? I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. <laughs> Look at verse 12. That ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom. We done seen the kingdom is a kingdom of power and it's a spiritual kingdom and it's a kingdom of Christ and glory. For this cause also we thank uh, God without ceasing because when you received the word of God which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You know why a lot of times the word don't work through in the believer's life? is because they don't believe the word. God never asked you to understand it. He asked you to believe it. I believe it whether I understand it or not. The understanding to come. But if I don't, there's more that I don't understand than there is that I do. But what I do know, I believe it. I believe it is the Word of God. This Word is a powerful book. This Word is the words of God. They will guide you. They will teach you. You get into the epistles of Paul. You ought to read the epistles of Paul over and over and over until you become saturated with the epistles of Paul and the doctrine in there and the Spirit of God will take that Word and guide your life through this Word. Psalm 9, not caught 90, 90 chapters and all together. And you'd read them. And the more you read them, the easier they are to read. And you can go through them over and over and over and over. And you say, well, I worked. I did it too. I used to work. I still work. I still put hours. More now than I did when I did work. Physical. I just want to 
want you to see, folks, this book is something that's special in the believer's life. If they'll let it be special, it'll work in you and guide you. You hate the Spirit of God. You know why the Spirit of God can't lead some of you? Because you don't have the Word, His Word in there. God's not going to send some angel down and talk to you at midnight. You would believe that anyway. Who wants to be woke up by at midnight by an angel standing at your foot and you, you have a heart attack? God knows that. How does the Spirit of God lead you? How does He talk to you? How does He guide you? He does, you he, it's not sitting in some corner on your head going, <laughs> something like that. It's not that way. How does God talk to you? He talks to you by the words He wrote down for you. But the people don't want to hear them. Well, they don't know them words. So they walk around in their life and go, Lord, what am I? Oh, God. God, show me your will. Oh, Lord, show me your will. God said, that's in the book. I wrote it for you. Sixth grade English. So if you read the book, you get this book in your heart. Then when the Lord, things come up in your life concerning whatever it might be, verses pop in your head. You know, me and June don't go down the hall quoting scripture at each other when we meet one another in the hall. <laughs> but there is a verse the Lord always, sometimes me and June dis disagree despite what you might think. And you know what that verse is? It's in Colossians. Every time if I start and I, and I, I you know, most time it's my fault. <laughs> According to her. <laughs> but at first, every time if we get in an argument or something, that verse popped me right square in it between the eyes. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And I back off. <laughs> I'm not to be bitter. Spirit of God told me not to be bitter against her. And I backed off. And then I go, pow. Because, <laughs> Lord, and sometimes I've said it, and I should, what verse are you giving her? <laughs> But anyway, it works. I'm telling you, it works. Look one other verse. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Folks, this is a great book. This is the greatest book you've got in, your, in the world. God wrote Romans through Philemon just for you. So you wouldn't be in this world alone. So you wouldn't be down here in this evil world and not know what the Lord expects out of you. He wrote it down for you. Look what he said in Romans uh, chapter 4, Hebrews. He said, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Pierce it even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is quick and powerful and that word will guide you in your everyday affairs. You ever get riled up with somebody? <coughs> You know the only one that really makes, especially, you know, when you're going down the road or something and, and, and they can't hear nothing you're saying and, and you just get all bent out of shape and, and you stop and you think, this is only affecting me. 
This is making me miserable inside. That guy that cut me off, him, him, he ain't feeling nothing now. I'm going getting upset. And then I think, be angry and what? And sin not. Let not the, your, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That's good for married couples. Don't ever go to bed mad at each other. Don't ever let that sun go down and y'all not talking. Be angry, sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Why? It can harden and change you. It's like a root. It's like the Bible calls it a root of bitterness. And if you let that fester inside and you especially you married couples and you 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 won't talk and everything and it just festers up and it gets worse and worse don't let the sun go down on your wrath get together walk and talk it out the spirit of God his word God's word worketh in us God worketh in us the Holy Spirit, this Word of God worketh in us. Look with me and uh, turn over to Colossians 1. Colossians 1. And I'm, I'm about to close. Colossians chapter 1. And notice in Colossians chapter 1, God's Word is powerful. But look what He says there. Verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily, powerful. There are two things that Paul's talking about. His word and his grace. And both of them come with knowledge. The Word will work in you if you know the Word and <clears throat> have a knowledge of the grace of God. Paul said, in fact, look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this brings me to my last point. The power of faith. God, the power of God worketh. God worketh in us. The Word worketh in us. Our faith works in us. Jesus said to his disciples, and I know that it has nothing to do with us today, but it's, a, it's an illustration I want you to see about faith. He said, if thou hast the faith as a grain of a mustard seed, I could say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it shall be. He's illustrating the power there of faith. Well, folks, there is a power of faith. God has done. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. He said, verse 10, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me, and uh, which was with me. The grace of God. How does the grace of God? Listen, folks, it motivated him. When you realize I'm saved by grace, I didn't deserve this. God saved me just out of his favor. He saved me. I don't deserve, I deserve hell. That should motivate us. The love of Christ constraineth us. His love, His grace, and what He did for me, it causes us to labor for Him. Give our lives to Him. Power of faith. Turn to you there in Corinthians. Look back in chapter 2. In chapter 2. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says there in verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, 
that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In other words, faith is taking God in his word. And faith is realizing, knowing that God is in you. God's word is what it says it is. And you can depend upon it. And you walk by it. You live your life by it. You can do what God tells you to do. There are some great promises in here for you. to you in 2 Corinthians 1 20 all the promises of God in him are yet they're positive there are some promises that God has promised you as a member of the body of Christ and your faith in that you believe in that gives you the grace to go on and folks I'm going to tell you something the closer we get to the coming of the Lord the more grace we're going to need and if you're not saved today, let me tell you, the grace of God is rich toward you right now. Today's the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't wait, as Kevin talked this morning. Don't wait till it's too late. You that's sitting in here right now, You've heard the gospel over and over. Some of you have heard it. Some of you have heard it over and over, yet you haven't heard it. But listen to me now. You can be saved if you're not saved. And if you are saved, then why don't you right now say, Lord, help me and my unbelief. And help me get the truth out. And may your power work in me. Folks, there's faith. There's power in faith. There's power in belief. Therefore, as we believe, so we speak. What you believe is what you speak. That's power. Will you exercise? Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for thy word. We thank you for letting us come here today. We pray that if there's one here that's lost, that this will be the day that they will just simply trust you as their personal Savior. Lord, may they do that right now. May they see themselves as a sinner. May they right now just simply believe that you died for them and paid for all of their sins. And they're going to trust that as their salvation. They're going to receive you in the atonement you give to them. And Lord, we pray that they'll do that and be saved. Father, I pray for the members of the body of Christ. We hope thy word has been a blessing to them. May it encourage them to keep on keeping on for the glory of the Lord. Everything that's accomplished through the ministry of this church, we'll give you the praise for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Shake hands with one another. And you